continuing with uh, Artemisia, remember we talked about the Judith paintings and the story of Judith and Holofernes and what that obviously meant to Artemisia, how she related perhaps to Judith. We talked about the violence and the, um, the, act, the active stance of the female figures in these works. Review of that, and here's another one we looked at, Judith and her maidservant leaving the tent, and the same topic here. So remind, we're just kind of bringing this along and, and, and a little bit of a reminder of this, of we already know the story of uh, the, the Judith paintings. Here's another one by Artemisia Gentileschi. It's Cleopatra. Cleopatra is the queen of Egypt, and here in this scene, she's choosing death on her own terms. Uh, she's heroic. And in this, feminist scholars have discussed how in this painting, uh, Artemisia sort of subverts rather than promotes the eroticized recumbent female nude. She's painted with a, in a very, it's uh, less sexualized in a more natural way. And also her agency is expressed. Notice that um, Cleopatra is in control and that's evident by the steady hand that clutches the snake, the poisonous asp. Um, and again, the closed fist is also considered to be a, um, a sort of a, a, a symbol of her power and control. And Artemisia shows us women with agency in all of her works. So this is why the Guerrilla Girls chose Cleopatra to be on the cover of their book, The Bedside Companion to the History of Western Art. So now we're, we're sort of over getting into this territory where we're thinking about women's ways of making art. Um, and this quote I find is helpful from Lucy Lippard, who's an American art critic and feminist. And she writes that the overwhelming fact remains that a woman's experience in this society, social and biological, is simply not like that of a man. So if art comes from the inside as it must, then the art of men and women must be different too. So women make art about their own experiences, and I think that's really important to think about. So let's review some other artists that we have covered and think about them in terms of a, a feminist lens, a feminist paradigm. Um, we've already talked about Frida, and again, some of you have written and discussed Frida. Uh, so we think about her as a great, as a great example of a, of a woman artist and a feminist and her concerns. Let's remember Yoko Ono. This is a, uh, we left off uh, talking about this in, under the heading of um, Yoko Ono as a conceptual artist and this a performance work called Cut Piece in which she exposed herself and to uh, audience members to cut away pieces of clothing and thinking about her, her vulnerability in this piece and we also think of it as a great work of feminist art. Louise Bourgeois has also been introduced uh, to you. We talked about her in Creative Process, so that's a great overlap. And we think about her and her concerns throughout her career as, an, as, a, as a woman who um, had a rich life to, to bring out in her art and uh, how she explored her experiences really personally as well. Here's some work by Louise Bourgeois from the 1940s even, where she's got, it's called Femme Maison, which is kind of a play on the word housewife. And she's thinking about female identity. The heads and bodies of nude female figures have been replaced by architectural forms, such as buildings and houses. And I, I find these are really quite rich, quite interesting. Uh, the woman doesn't not, not, is, that can't see herself as well. She's sort of hidden by the house. And I think there's a lot going on here. We can think about notions of the domestic uh, women's lives in that are so closely linked to the home, but also the idea of entrapment. Of course, these are the works that we know the best of Louise Bourgeois, the spiders for which she's most famous, and thinking about her relationship with her mother, her strength, her mother's strength and her protective nature, and also her mother's work as a restorer of tapestries and how spiders are associated with spinning and weaving. Okay, here's an important work that was made in the 1970s, Judy Chicago's Dinner Party. It, it, was, it, was, took place, or it was made over a period of four or five years by the artist Judy Chicago, and it was a collaborative project. Um, she had help from a lot of women and some men who made parts of the work for her. 
What you're looking at is a large triangular table with place settings for 39 women, so 13 on each side, who made important contributions to, the, to world history. And on the tiles on the floor, which you can see a little bit of here in this image, there are 999 more women's names inscribed. At each place setting, you have a hand embroidered a runner and a porcelain plate and a chalice that's designed in honor of that specific woman. So we'll show you a few more images here. This is what the large back out and see the large triangular table with the tiles and inside the triangular space. And some details of some specific settings. See Emily Dickinson, the poet. And here's Judith, our character from the Old Testament. So the women's, the place settings have been set for women that are both um, historical and uh, mythological. So um, also you might probably notice that there's some very explicit genitalia, the, the references to the to women's body is very um, um, obvious in the places, the place settings. And for this as well, um, people are, not everybody likes the, um, sort of what we call this, the sort of essentializing of women's roles and their creative, the idea, in the 1970s, what I'm trying to tell you is that there was this sort of essential feminism that women were sort of like earthy and maternal and m the whole Mother Earth kind of hippie thing. So th have take some of that into consideration here of the time that it was made. And there is some um, warranted criticism of this kind of essentializing of what, what, what women are that Judy Chicago was doing. I think interestingly though, an important thing that she did was she brought forward some women's ways of making, like needlework, um, elevating the uh, craft materials to a higher uh, plane by giving them a place in a gallery with a setting, and that actually has been a really important um, movement, and Judy Chicago is not the only person who did that. Um, so, so Chicago's intention was to celebrate the reproductive power of birth and creation, but some people think that there are too many vaginas in the dinner party. It's a famous piece, it's an important piece, and is given a permanent home now in a museum in Brooklyn, and it's definitely still worth talking about. So, Judy Chicago. Another woman of the same time period, uh, working in the 1970s, was Anna Mendieta. She, in her work, you'll also see links to earth art, uh, because she um, used her body and, went, and, you, and worked out of doors, uh, creating pieces and then documenting them with photography. So here's a couple of examples. There, uh, there's a feminist political message about violence against the female body in her series called Silhouetta. Um, she made an imprint into the sand or mud and painted her silhouette also against walls. Um, and in this case, in the Tree of Life series, um, she coated herself with mud and photographed herself against a tree. Again, you have this kind of um, essentializing uh, 1970s kind of um, earth mother thing, um, references to birth and growth and nature. Very tragically, um, Anna Mandetta died violently in the prime of her life. She fell from a 34th floor apartment in New York City. She was with her husband, Carl Andre, a sculptor who was known to be violent, and they had been drinking. Um, he was tried and acquitted of her murder, and that's something that is... Uh, still talked about in uh, um, a, a sad part of Anna, Anna Mendieta's life. So now I want to tell you about Cindy Sherman. She is, again, from the 70s, uh, active in the 70s, but is still living and active in, in New York today. And she's interesting for, it's going to come out in several ways now to talk about Cindy Sherman because she's a photographer, but she she dresses up and puts herself in the images. And so she's exploring some of the things we've talked about, including the male gaze, by subverting it, by taking, she takes control of the image herself. And she dresses up in ways that, well, I'll see, it'd sort of be nice if we were together, we could discuss this and see what you think of. But she's exploring kind of um, stereotypes of women as victims as powerless creatures, especially in films such as film noir, Hitchcock, uh, the kind of the genre of horror, 
uh, where women are uh, powerless, something bad is about to happen to them. So the series is called Untitled Film Still, and she, she did um, many, many of these. And she and as I mentioned too, by she pro appropriates the space on both sides of the lens. So she she directs and designs the picture, but she also puts herself in it. So it sort of disrupts the way we usually think about this kind of image. And it's really powerful work. Um, and here's another work by her, another series called Centerfolds, where she Again, there's like a drama. She's holding a crumpled note in her hand, the figure, and it makes us wonder like what's happening and why is she lying on the floor. We are left to create the narrative, to ask ourselves what has gone before and what will happen next. And we'll talk about Cindy Sherman again when we talk about postmodernism, which is coming up as well, because it's sort of really important work in terms of what Cindy Sherman has uh, created in her... Um, her references. I'm going to leave it for now. Okay, the last artist I'm going to tell you about today and then I'm going to leave you with a, uh, some other material that you can look up is Kara Walker, an African-American artist. She's very much still active. She's been uh, working for um, a couple of decades now, um, exploring themes of slavery, sex, violence, assault, injustice, treachery, her works address specifically violence done to African-American women. Throughout her career, she has played with stereotypes as well, using cut paper silhouettes, a technique that provides a strong commentary on the history of the South, slavery, and the Civil War. Uh, she works often from uh, existing source material, such as Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War, where she's sort of taking an existing text and acting on it juxtaposing Harper's version with her own images and questioning the notion that slavery ended with the war. So here's some nice examples <clears throat> of work by Kara Walker. I'm just going to show you some details. Again, the silhouettes. These would be big cutouts on gallery walls. And some of you may have um, researched Kara Walker because she was an option in the Creative Process Contemporary Artist project that we did. So that some of you have been have seen some examples of Kara Walker's work. She makes some film, she makes some video, some installations. And maybe some of you did explore this work. I, I think this is a really interesting, very recently made large sculptural installation, installation I want to tell you about. Is created as a temporary installation because this Domino Sugar Factory refinery building was going to be torn down. So she had an opportunity to make a large work in that space. And so it, she created the work, documented it, and then the, it doesn't exist anymore. There's some really good video about uh, her walking around the space, working on it, and talking about it as well on Art21 and other sites. I would uh, direct you towards if you want to learn more about this. When she encountered the space, the walls were still coated with, the, with dripping molasses, the remnant or residue of the labor of sugar production, which was largely performed by African-American enslaved people. So it's symbolic, deeply symbolic of the slave trade and the African-American experience, this, the history that would be in a factory like this. Uh, for her work, she decided to create a sphinx-like creature, thinking back to uh, Egypt and the sphinx. With but she plays with what else? Which the representation here with a what's called a mammy's head, which references kind of a stereotype like an Aunt Jemima type of figure. And then can't see the full body from this uh, slide that I have, but there's an over-sexualized kind of exaggerated breasts and buttocks that refer to. Um, the black female body in popular culture. The Sphinx is made of 35 tons of sugar and sugar paste. And surrounding the Sphinx figure, the massive figure, are boys that are carrying baskets of fruit and sugar, which are sort of serving and honoring the Sphinx. And they are um, the children of slaves. The black female body here takes on mythical proportions. Who is the slave and who is the master? It's a wonderful, complicated piece. It confronts prejudice head on. 
and it gives a power or majesty back to the black female body made of sugar. So Kara Walker is a great person for you to find out more about. I'm going to leave you today with recommended resources for more reading and exploration. A couple of easy sites. The Khan Academy site, it's called A Brief History of Women in Art, and there's lots of artists listed there that you can then click on and read about. And then the, the next source is it's called The Art Assignment, which is videos on YouTube called Fierce Women of Art. And each one features five women. So part one has the Gorilla Girls, Karita Kent, Linda Benglis, Sho Lu, and Kara Walker. And part two has Artemisa Gentileschi, Mona Hatoum, Frida Kahlo, Hannah Hoch, and Yayoi Kusama. And that's a really good, uh, those videos are awesome. They're really, they're very punchy and short and entertaining. So for further uh, reading and enjoyment, uh, please consult those resources. And I'm going to sign out and thank you for um, uh, listening and watching. I hope that was okay. I know I made a few mistakes. I'm going to be back in a couple of days with a talk for you on LGBTQ plus culture in, we'll look at it historically and in a contemporary way. Okay, take care everybody.